This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, let's turn to another clip from the Putin interviews, where the Russia president talks about how the Soviet Union entered the nuclear arms race. You remember how the nuclear project developed? When the United States created the nuclear bomb and the Soviet Union entered the race and started to actively develop the nuclear program, Russia had both Russian scientists working, foreign scientists, Germans primarily. But our intelligence also received a lot of information from the United States. Suffice it to remember the Rosenberg spouses, who were electrocuted. They didn't acquire that information. They were just transferring that information. But who acquired it? The scientists themselves, those who developed the atomic bomb. Why did they do that? Because they understood the dangers. They let the genie out of the bottle, and now the genie cannot be put back. And this international team of scientists, I think, were more intelligent than the politicians. They provided this information to the Soviet Union of their own volition to restore the nuclear balance in the world. And what are we doing right now? We're trying to destroy this balance, and that is a great mistake. So stop referring to them as partners, our partners. You've said that too much. But the dialogue has to be pursued further. Oliver Stone, his views on the nuclear arms race. He's a resilient negotiator. He comes back, he, he, he doesn't take no. He always talks and tries to keep it open. He's worried. I think I saw him more weary than ever. And listen, this thing is dangerous because we put ABMs in Poland and Romania. You know that. It's a stated fact. ABMs are very dangerous. They can be shifted into offensive weapons overnight. They won't know. The Russians won't know what's in the air, if it's offensive or defensive. And they're very close. So the time, very, it's not like Dr. Strangelove, where you have a little more time. In that movie, you had an hour or two hours or whatever it was. Now you're down to 15 minutes. So there's a much more chance of an accident. The problem is with parity and America committing again, or under Obama, to another trillion dollar program to remodernize all our nuclear uh, weapons. It's a hopeless race because you're going to either we're going to the Russian economy is not going to be able to keep up. They don't. They have one. They spend one tenth of our budget on military, and uh, what's going to happen if we keep spending and blowing them out? We have a, We want first strike superiority. I believe we may have it, and when we have it, what are we going to do with it? With people like Mattis and the people in the Defense Department, you have to worry. I wanted to turn to uh, your most recent interview with Vladimir Putin in February. So this is when Donald Trump is president. When you asked him about Senator John McCain, a well-known, fierce critic of Vladimir Putin. And uh, it seems if Senator McCain, for example, today or yesterday was proposing a veto, a Senate veto, of any lifting of sanctions from Trump in advance. You know, unfortunately, there are many senators like that in the United States. Putin is a killer. There is no moral equivalence between the United States and Putin's Russia. I repeat, there is no moral equivalent between that butcher and thug and KGB colonel and the United States of America, the country that Ronald Reagan used to call a shining city on a hill. Well, honestly, I like Senator McCain to a certain extent. And I'm not joking. I like him because of his patriotism. And I can relate to his consistency in fighting for the interests of his own country. You know, in ancient Rome, there was Marcus Portius Cato, the elder, who always finished all of his speeches using the same words, Carthage must be destroyed. Carthage must be destroyed. People with such convictions, like the senator you mentioned, they still live in the old world. 
and they're reluctant to look into the future. They are unwilling to recognize how fast the world is changing. They do not see a real threat, and they cannot leave behind the past, which is always dragging them back. On the other hand, we've been supporting the U.S. fight for independence. We were allies during World War I and World War II. Right now, there are common threats we're both facing, like international terrorism. We've got to fight poverty across the world, the environmental deterioration, which is a real threat to all humanity. After all, we've piled up so many nuclear weapons that it has become a threat to the whole world as well, and it would be good for us to give it some thought. There are many issues to address. If you can respond to his response to um, McCain. Also, you actually are more critical of Putin when you're questioning him than here. I mean, you drill down a lot, well, yeah. whether you were talking about the uh, Russian hacking of the elections, which, by the way, just recently Putin said, uh, talking about Russian hackers may have having to play a role, he suggested that they may well have been the case. And it's not just about hacking or getting into the spaces. A, a lot of countries do it. And yeah. especially the United States as well. well, it's about weaponizing that and releasing that information. But you were quite critical when you were actually speaking to him. Well, I was trying. You know, it's—I uh, am digging. Um, some people, there are things that people say. You know, when you put a camera on somebody for four hours, there's a certain behavior, the eyes, there's a feeling about the person. You, you get—you can't get that from uh, reading the text. So I, I think there's great value in a camera and the body language. His body language is fascinating because it's not very overt. You don't see the Castro mannerisms or the Chavez ones, but you see little things. Both of whom you've interviewed. His, yeah. And his eyes are very half Asiatic, you know, they're almost uh, they're Russian eyes. And, but you see, I, I know the man much better after spending time watching him. I have to say, he likes patriotism. He's certainly a nationalist in that way, he, in the interest of Russia, not bellicose, but a wounded nationalism. He feels that patriotism is important in Russia, the idea of Russia, not a return to the old empire, what? but a continuation of a new empire that's capitalist with a market economy that would work in Europe. Let's get to uh, Putin discussing Fidel Castro, assassination attempts, and his own personal sure. security. And in 2012, you run for president, and you win by 63 yeah, percent? You're right. Three times president, five assassination attempts, I'm told. Not as much as Castro, who I've interviewed. I think he must have had 50, but uh, there's a legitimate five I've heard about. Yes, I talked with Castro about that. And he said to me, do you know why I'm still alive? And I asked him, why? Because I was always the one to deal with my security personally. I do my job and the security officers do theirs. And they are still performing quite successfully. In other words, you trust your security and, and they've done a great job. I trust them. Because always the first mode of assassination, you try to get inside the security of the, of the president. I know that. Do you know what they say among the Russian people? They say that those who are destined to be hanged are not going to drown. What is your fate, sir? Have you, do you know? Only God knows our destiny, yours and mine. To die in bed, maybe. One day, this is going to happen to each and every one of us. The question is what we will have accomplished by then in this transient world, and whether we'll have enjoyed our life. Was Putin uh, philosophizing about life and death uh, as, a, as, a, as a leader? Your sense of uh, how he approaches the possibility of possible yeah. assassination? Well, I think he has a very uh, Russian philosophical view. Uh, I was kidding him about Dostoevsky, but, you know, when you've been the leader of a, a, a vilified like you have, and you have Chechen terrorists trying to kill you, and, you, you know, Syrians now, it's not easy uh, to run this whole thing every day. He doesn't know what's going to happen. The United States may do something again very provocative. Well, he, like the U.S., is also killing Syrians. I think the U.S. now-led coalition has surpassed Russia, but they have both been, to say the least, complicit. Well, in, well, I don't want to get off topic, but basically, you know, the, the bombing, the Russian bombing on the roads against the trucks really destroyed the foundation of the ISIS empire, which is for money and oil and shipping through Turkey. He got to the base. Obama bombed for, what, three, four years, didn't achieve anything. He talks about running 100 sorties a day. The Russians were intense. It seemed to stop the flow. The momentum. Uh, as to Ten terrorism, seconds. you know his feelings, because he comes from a background where there's been a lot of it in Russia. 
We have to leave it yeah. there. Okay. Um, but we're going to do a post show and we'll put it online at democracynow.org. Oliver Stone, three time Academy Award winning director and screenwriter. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.